right, welcome back. I'm your host, Michael Stamatinos with Advancing Healthcare Innovation Show. And, and if you're new to us, we're just crazy passionate about healthcare innovation and adoption. And our aim is to bring real stories about innovation within the marketplace, highlighting real people with great stories. And if you haven't checked out any of the previous recordings or any of the previous interviews, uh, go ahead and do that right now. But we've got a jam-packed year with some incredible interviewers that are coming on. And I'm absolutely delighted to have today Dr. Mark Weissman, Chief Medical Information Officer, Title Health. Dr. Weissman, pleasure to have hey, you. Michael, good seeing you again. How are you? Awesome, doing great. So would you mind maybe we just kind of maybe take a step back a little and share a little bit of your story? Because I think it's, it's extra special in the sense that you're sort of a dual threat. You're a clinician, and yet you're doing a lot of entrepreneurial type ventures. Uh, would you mind maybe just kind of giving the audience a little bit of background about you and your story? Yeah, sure. Happy to. So I, I am a doctor, a uh, little over 20 plus years now in internal medicine, done some hospitalist work, also did some uh, ambulatory, more ambulatory lately. And my colleagues, as we entered this electronic record, I started on paper. I'm one of those older docs now. Um, we... We made the move to, we went to the Epic Electronic Health Record and it was an exciting time and we digitized everything. Some providers struggled making that leap. And one of my roles in my pilot organization was, I was kind of the data guy. I, I like to win arguments and having all the data is the guy who wins all the arguments. So, uh, I got into data. One of the things I looked at though was what time of night providers were closing their charts. And these were primary care providers. They're not like the trauma surgeons on call, in the middle of the night. So I was looking and I saw that over 50% of my colleagues were closing their charts after 8 p.m. And that's what's called pajama time in, in healthcare. And I knew that's not sustainable and not healthy. And it really bothered me that some of my colleagues, they just couldn't figure out how to use this electronic health record and make it work for them rather than them working for it. And so I got involved with, just I transformed what I was doing to focus on provider well-being and in really focusing mostly on how to get through your office visit, your days, easier, better, faster, and more enjoyable, connected to your patients. So that's how I kind of got into the tech side of things. I, about three and a half years ago, I took a role at uh, Title Health and that's on the eastern shore of Maryland, and I'm now the chief medical information officer. About seven months ago, they also made me the chief information officer, so now I have both roles. So um, I consider myself to be dangerous. I'm a chief medical information officer with a budget, and so that's always, that's always dangerous. Doctors with budgets is definitely <laughs> dangerous. So I do, but I really get to have an impact now on technology and innovation and a much bigger more a broader impact on the organization as a whole. And now it's not just providers that I'm responsible for making this technology work better. It's the whole organization. And I'm excited about that. So uh, a little so, bit about my journey. Thanks for sharing that. So so through the progression of your of your career, how how has your definition of innovation has it evolved over time? And if so, what what is your your current definition of innovation? So my definition of innovation definitely changed, boy, it's probably 10 years ago, I don't know, maybe less so, where our family went into the water bottle business, and we created a plastic fruit infusion water bottle, and it, there wasn't anything really like it on the market. It was my son that came up with it, and we took this journey. Uh, we landed on Shark Tank, and we were, you know, we were in front of the sharks, and we did that whole whole bit, that whole Hollywood scene and, the, and Good Morning America and all the press that comes with these things. It was a fascinating journey, but it really taught me about, all right, we're going to build something, we're going to pivot, we're going to fix it, we're going to change. It's, it was, how do we do things quick and nimble? And you're a startup running out of your garage. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a dumb doctor. What do I know about international logistics and uh, being able to ship products and you know, it's, it starts off where you bang on the on the floor and yell at the kids, I need two water bottles going to Australia and they go and run around and make that happen. It really did change my perspective. And I, I can 
relate better to the innovators in healthcare who are trying to do things now. Healthcare is tough. Healthcare doesn't change very quickly. And there are many who have come in and tried and then left with their tail between their legs. Uh, so I really, I really applaud those who are making that leap and that innovation, which is to bring something not incremental, but transformational into healthcare. That's how I define it, is that you're not just tinkering around the edges. You're coming in to make a difference, maybe in, in just a specific area. You don't have to fix all the healthcare, but you're coming into your area and you're going to make it significantly better. That is innovation in my book. So what, what are some examples? I mean, you've been in this new role. Yeah, you've, it sounds like you've, you've embodied innovation even prior to having the title in terms of helping your peers stop and closing out uh, their charge uh, you know, during pajama time. What have been some little wins maybe that you're able to, to share or things that uh, you think might be a great example of what it meant to innovate, especially during, I just call it over the course of the last 24 months, which have been, they've been bizarre. Uh, yes. Yeah. Share any, any stories that you might be able to add, I think would be great. There's this one company that I'm working with now, and uh, their name is Health Tensor. I'll throw them out there. They're a startup. We'll give them a little shout out here. <laughs> I have no financial connection to them whatsoever, but they really impressed me with one of the things that they're doing, which they use artificial intelligence to help doctors write their notes. And different than dictation, this is not me speaking to a microphone and some words appear. What this tool does is it knows that doctors tend to practice a certain way. And if I'm doing an admission on someone with congestive heart failure, it'll take a look at the last 50 times I've done that and they'll learn my practice pattern. Guess what? With congestive heart failure, I'm going to give this person some furosemide. I'm going to get some fluid off of them. I'm going to check their electrolytes. I'm going to keep them a few days, check an echo, send them home. Well, my note tends to reflect that. My, my training has kind of ingrained this in me. My 20 years of experience, I kind of do the same thing. Well, this tool will look and say, well, what did the emergency room doctor say? What's the lab data say? What does the echo say? And then say, ah, this looks like one of those heart failure things that Mark's done before. Well, let's start to build his note for him. Help not, now it's not, it's not gonna sign the note or anything. It's, it's gonna set up a framework that it knows, hey, I typically do these things. What do you think? They're going to tee that up for me. And then I'll go through, approve, add, make it the unique personal document it needs to be. But a big chunk of my note could already be done for me, knowing that I'm going to say those things that I've always said. I've said it the last 50 times. I'm probably going to say it the 51st time, too. So I really, I really think that was a very impressive tool because it gets to how do we help doctors get their notes done because that's, that's a big source of frustration. Number two, how do I, how does the computer help me catch things that, hey, did you know the ED doctor said this little thing? And don't put it in my note. And as I'm reading my note, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. So I'm, it helps me catch things, which I like providing better care. And then it uses wording, it uses codes. But in healthcare, you get paid by how well you document things. So these companies figured out how to say things. And I may say it very simply, and it'll translate that into the words that the, the coding and documenting people like to see, so that you can get the billing credit. So they help pay for themselves too, which in healthcare, you gotta go, you gotta follow the flow of, of the stream here. You can't go against the, the money, you gotta go with it. So this helps that tool. Uh, they're hitting in all, all those areas, I really like them. So that's just an area that I was impressed now. That may not be blowing people's minds in terms of clinical innovation, like it, it, I don't know that you know we're we're for COVID that it dramatically changed things. We're just going live with this product now, getting it installed, but it's going to revolutionize, I think, how doctors do their notes, and that's exciting to me. Well, you also mentioned uh, previously about you know um, provider burnout, you know, in a sense, and that when you're taking work home with you, you know, outside of the four walls of where you practice. And, and it kind of overspilling into other spaces of your life, there's a, there's tension there. So the fact that you're, you're looking at something is maybe someone could say, well, it's minuscule. Well, 
innovation is incrementally getting better. And eventually I think as you start to kind of improve some of those little things that does leave room for the big wow transformational things, or perhaps maybe it's a, it's doing a lot of little things right that leads to the big transformation. You know, when you combine all of them together, I'm, I'm curious about the journey that it takes for someone or an entity or an enter, you know, to get into a title health. You obviously uh, are, are an influencer and a decision maker, but I would imagine that there are other folks that are, that are involved in that. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that process just for some of the entrepreneurs that are listening? Access is definitely a challenge. I'd love for you to maybe share or illustrate how, how that actually happened. I don't, I think it, maybe it was a, a cold call. I don't remember exactly how I got connected with Health Tensor, but I'll tell you, I get 10, 20 emails a day that are all about, I've got this new product, it's innovative. I get LinkedIn requests. It's very, very difficult to get in front of those decision makers because at this point, I've set up my, my in-basket email filters to block just about everything possible. Because as a CIO, I have to be paying attention to my customers. And those are the doctors and nurses who are on the front line. So I understand how difficult it is. And so I do set aside time, uh, particularly if I go to HIMSS, which I don't go to anymore, but Chime or uh, some of the, the conferences where the Gartner conference I was at recently. I just I want to connect with those who are doing some things that are innovative. But I got to block time for it. I got to have the mindset for it. Because if I'm worried about putting out a fire, you know, some someone clicked on something and did something bad on our system, something like that, I can't focus on innovation at that time. But I do listen to podcasts. So people are doing innovation type things. And they're, if they're out there on podcasts, yes, that's how I, when I'm commuting. I'll put on a podcast. I'll just listen and say, who's doing something cool in my space? That's how you get me. And I'll reach out. I'll come find them. So that's helpful to the, know. The lead, the lead time, I think, you know, just to give an example again with Health Tensor, I don't know. I think it's four years I've been talking to these guys, trying to, you know, I couldn't get buy in with doctors. I couldn't get buy in with administrators. Now I'm in a position where I know this is the right tool. I showed it to a couple of colleagues and they're like, oh, yeah, we should be doing this already. I'm like, no kidding. We've been doing it four years ago. So it sounds like there's, uh, in terms of you bringing in external innovation in, there's there's a bit of grit that's involved in you being able to get things moving. Contacts are huge, obviously, and that's not something you can easily build as the vendor. You know, you, you immediately are going to get the you know the your vendor you know arms length. But there's some vendors that do it differently. They build the relationship first, and they might just ask for, hey, give us some guidance on, on you know, the product or, yeah, sure. I'm, if I have the time and I can just give two cents to someone, great. They're not asking for anything. They're not asking you know, to, to install anything. Or, but they're just building relationships. And over time, uh, you kind of get, you know, yeah, these guys are good. They're on to something. Or maybe, they, you know what, they're probably going in the wrong direction. I don't want to go with them, but maybe I helped an entrepreneur get somewhere. I like helping people. That's the doctor side of me. So if I can help, great. But not every one of those will translate into a sale. The ones that it's just, hey, we want to do, you know, we want 10 minutes of your time right now. Yeah, probably not. Probably yeah. not. Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is that the emphasis is really around, and this has just been some great advice that I've been given to from, from many mentors. Uh, but they always say, you know, ask for advice. Uh, you may end up inadvertently down the line getting a sale out of it, but that's not your first initial, it's not your first thing. Because if you go in there, you're asking for a sale, you may end up either getting nothing and at best, maybe getting advice. So I think what you're what you're saying there is, is very, very sound. And it seems like what you're saying also is that, hey, you got to be in it for the long game. And if there's anything that we've we've come to know about healthcare, and you mentioned it earlier, is that things don't tend to move at a pace that really satisfies a lot of entrepreneurs and they want to speed up the process. And I haven't seen a magic bullet yet so far that has sped up a process when you're trying to deploy something at scale to multiple health systems or a health system or just a single hospital. Um, so sorry for healthcare those that are listening. <laughs> healthcare is so risk adverse. 
that that hey we're gonna fail fast and pivot kind of thing doesn't always resonate very well with the chief information officers they tend to yeah that's risky that's an artificial intelligence scary thing you know they that, and that causes some some retrenchment in, in thinking but i will tell i'll give some advice i have i don't I can't think of a time where I have turned down a request from a doctor that wants to talk to me. And for whatever the reason is, just the shared experience of being a doctor, I know that they care, they've been committed to a lifetime. It's not really, you know, they're, they're not gonna, doctors most of the time are not gonna get behind something that's really slimy. So yeah. it kind of brings a, a certain level of instant, um, just a, that instant accreditation to that, they, that they're real. Yeah. So, uh, for those entrepreneurs, go grab a doctor. Uh, <laughs> they, they can be helpful on the sales side. We're not good at selling anything, usually, ever. <laughs> but if, if they have genuine love for the product, it comes out, comes across. Makes total sense. Where, where are you most excited about? Where do you see the biggest opportunity, you know, thinking ahead? And, and how far along do you think ahead when you are planning and, and strategizing for the organization? So with the organization I'm in now, I'm not doing bench research. I'm not coming up with new molecules or things, or, or and we don't have an artificial intelligence team, like a machine learning team, data scientists. We don't have that. We're, we're smaller than that, a lot smaller than that. So really what we're doing in our space is looking to see who, who is moving the needle. And we're probably looking for someone who's, who's got a good idea and can and, and is looking for a partner to kind of play with and we're willing to be a little white mouse and be experimented on and then i've got a big mouth and so i can use that mouth to help you guys out there with the product works and is good yeah you know let's talk about it because other doctors want to know about it so i'm interested right now so Value-based care is extremely difficult, I'm finding. And it takes a ton of technology to do it right. And so that's, you have to pull these pieces together, the telehealth piece, because you got to do the outreach and you have to have be in constant contact with the patients, not just this, oh, you show up in my office every three months and I'll help you. It's got to be more engaging. And there's, there's, so there's CRM tools that are involved here. There's electronic health record, there's integrating data with others, which is a nightmare in healthcare. Anyone who wants to solve that problem, just step on up to the plate. <laughs> Improperability is a mess. We cannot get the data we need. That's what I'm excited is really about value-based care and the really the pieces behind it. So it's easy to say, yeah, we're a value-based care organization. Really? What tools do you have that helps you get there? And that's innovating in that space. That's interesting stuff. Okay. Well, you just said something that spurned me. So after this, I'm definitely going to be connecting you to a few people that I know that are doing that uh, on the health system side. So for sure, that's always a, a good thing. And where where else are you? Are, are, you, know, you mentioned about podcasts and other resources. How? What about you know colleagues, other CMIO colleagues, other CIO colleagues? I mean, how often do you pick up the phone and reach out to them? And do you get together? And what are those collaborative sessions like? I mean. Yeah, you know, obviously making a lot of decisions. So I'm just curious, sort of what your what your matrix is like. So as a new CIO, I was on the phone multiple times a week asking my buddies for help. So I've got a I've got a friend who he, we went to medical school together. Uh, there's probably not many medical school classes that now have two CIOs in them. That's probably pretty rare. But George Washington University, the class of 1997, produced two CIOs. And so Lee Milligan out at Asante, I, I reconnected with him as I was going through my CMIO journey. And I looked up to Lee a lot and, and leaned on him heavily for guidance throughout this last seven months or even before that, just trying to figure this, this out. So yes, there's definitely contacts that I, I make and maintain. Uh, I went to the Chime conference and it was incredibly inclusive how they just, I, I went in and said, hi, I'm new. And they just grabbed me and said, come on, you're new CIO, let's introduce you. They introduced me to some vendors that were good to see. And they introduced me to other CIOs, particularly other 
physician CIOs. We're kind of this rare breed where there seems to be like a growing momentum of us going from the CMIO role to CIO. And so those who have done it before me, I reach out, I grab onto them and say, what are you working on? What work? Don't let me step on that landmine early in my career. Because you pick the wrong partner to go with and something's big and visible and ugly. Yeah, that's not good for long-term <laughs> success as a CIO. And, and how do you... How do you assess problems? How do you evaluate and prioritize problems? I mean, you mentioned about the physician um, taking notes and and and, that, and basically kind of reducing burden in a sense on a physician having to you know do things over and over and over again. What are some of the things that you guys are assessing? You know, to the degree that you're able to actually share, you know, anything that's non-confidential. Things that bring efficiency to the processes definitely catch my attention. Robotic process automation, healthcare, light years behind finance and other industries. So absolutely, I'm looking for tools that help with provisioning right now. So the biggest complaint I get as CIO is a nurse comes into the organization, it's her first day on the ward, and whatever she got provisioned for tools is completely wrong. And now she can't do her job. We look silly as a healthcare organization trying to make good experience for new employees. And so I need the humans out of that loop. I need the robot to do that and do it right every single time without skipping a step to do exactly what it's told and to have that all laid out in advance. Now that's huge work to set all that up because a nurse is not a nurse. Some nurses do pediatrics, some nurses do ICU, some nurses do dialysis. They all need different tools. And you got to know, right, this nurse, well, they're doing dialysis today, but they're going to be in the ED tomorrow. And you got to know all that. So getting that process down, that's, that's what catches my attention these days, is anything that's helping me with efficiency, particularly in the back end, if you can make efficiency in the front end, great. If you can make it easier for doctors and nurses, you can make the, trans, the technology blend into the background. So that is not struggling. So that I, like I'm looking you in the eye right now. Yeah. I want to look at my patients in the eye. I don't want to be down here on the keyboard trying to figure out where I'm supposed to go, where I'm supposed to be clicking. Bring that efficiency to the front line, fantastic. A lot of that has been done. Now it's a lot of efficiency we need on the back end. We, we are incredibly manual, particularly in the quality space. Reporting quality measures to the government to registries involves humans going through charts one page at a time, looking for little bits of gold to pick out and send somewhere. It's going to bankrupt healthcare. The amount of wasted labor that goes into this stuff, there's no value add. There's not a single patient who gets directly better by someone looking through the chart three months after the patient was in the hospital. So it's that kind of stuff that automation and efficiency that can be brought to that would be amazing. Okay. So now we know sort of your, you know, in a roundabout way, some of your, some of your wish list things. So for those that are listening, uh, you've been given quite a few, quite a few golden nuggets here uh, in this particular conversation. So, you know, Mark, what, 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 are, what are some other things that you feel like you want people to know? I mean, we're getting closer towards the end here, but I just want to know, I mean, if there's, if there's one golden take, if whether it be to your CIO colleagues or to um, folks that are innovating within within the health system space, what what is that one bit of advice that you would say that you know they need to kind of take home and implement? Because it's really all about ideas or make you feel good, but really the implementation is where things really happen. The advice I would give is first to my CMIO colleagues that it is definitely worth the leap going to the CIO spot because of what tends to follow with that is the budget and the FTEs. And it'd be great if uh, CMIOs have always been an influencing role, but when they get into the CIO role and the focus is how do I make life better for the other doctors and nurses that are out there, that is transformational uh, in terms of how I've looked at healthcare now. And I think my CMIO cogs, my advice is make that leap. Figure out, make that on your pathway to how to influence healthcare to be better from the CIOC. 
probably and, and having the CMIO role as well is probably crazy to do both, but I find it very rewarding. I also don't sleep, but I find it very rewarding. Um, I probably do need an associate CMIO to pick up more of the pick up some help, but that's that's my advice in terms of those outside you know the, the you're not practicing clinicians right now but you're you're out there in terms of connect with vendors that are that are just you fall in love with what they're doing and see how you can help i think there needs to be more doctors involved nurses too at the startup phase helping guide these companies because i've heard some really lousy ideas out there around like that's never gonna work i just know that because I, I personally have been there. Now, some people are like, well, we're going to fail fast. You're going to fail, period. <laughs> so, so sometimes it helps if you have that clinician right up front saying, health systems will never bite into what you're selling. So let's pivot now before you even get there, before you get that first no. Let's, let's try to go for that yes, uh, a little yes at least. That's my two cents. Well, this has been incredibly helpful, Dr. Weissman. And just for, for those of you that are consuming the content, wherever you are, would you would you mind sharing this on social media, commenting, liking it? I'm just so grateful when we can continue on in this journey and gather more like-minded folks that really truly want to advance healthcare forward, whether you're an innovator in digital health or whether you're a clinician or you know a rising leader within an organization that just wants to make an impact. So we need more doers in the community. So Dr. Weissman, I'm just incredibly grateful that you've been able to share this time with us and just share a lot of great lessons and valuable information. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing some more success stories when you come back and you're always welcome to come back. Love it. Thank you, Michael. Love what you're doing with the show. Glad to be a guest anytime. Thanks so much. Thank you.